Well, good morning to everyone here. Whether you're watching in person or you're watching online, I want to thank you for coming to the service. All right, so we are in a season. Let's say an early Merry Christmas to you all. As you can see by decorations, we get the memo into the choir. Isn't in Christmas mode yet to get songs. So today I will be speaking about the birth of Christ today. And the title for this sermon this morning is The King is Born. The King is Born. Such the reason for the season, not the presents that we receive and what we have the best present we could ever have, and that is Jesus Christ coming down on earth in the form of man, humbling himself. And when he came down, he came down in the, as a baby going through the pain and everything that we went through so that it would be a full understanding of what we are suffering, and he can relate with us. Our text for this morning is from Matthew 2, verses 1 to 6. Matthew 2, verses 1 to 6. And it reads, Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem saying, Where is he who, was, who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. Now, wh- when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests, and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophets, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. Amen. No, that verse, that verse six, out of um, you, Bethlehem, are not the least in the rulers of Judah. Comes from Micah five two. It's a place that's, um, you know, one of the low cities in, at the time. It says, and that's why I had to say, are not the least among the rulers of Judah. It's like saying I'm in this. Um, now, one of the smaller places in Ontario is coming the greatest king that could ever be. The king of any kingdom, whatever kingdom it is, it's a, whether it's a little village or it's a great kingdom, is extremely important for that place that the king rules. As that king determines the prosperity or downfall of the kingdom. Whatever decision the king makes impacts the people in that kingdom. They look forward to that king and for direction on, and for wisdom. Now, if the king is not wise in the decision that he makes, it creates a downfall. So there is huge respect for the king. There is huge respect for the first prince of that 
kingdom because that prince is protected, not because they so much like the prince, but more so because that prince is going to take over and become the king one day and direct them. So the people, whether they're old or young, look forward and say, these people will direct my children. Um, this prince will direct whoever, um, if I'm still alive at the time. So the king and his lineage is very important. Now, Herod the Great, I'm going to say Herod the Great because this is one of the six Herods in the time of the Bible. The first is Herod the Great. So they are different. There's the Herod, the, um, the Tetrarch, and there are different Herods out there. Um, Herod um, Agrippa the first, Herod Agrippa the second, and they were different time frames. The, the Herod that that beheaded John the Baptist is different from the Herod at the time of Jesus' birth. And it's different from the Herod at the time of Herod Agrippa at the time um, Peter uh, and J James was killed and Peter was imprisoned. Now, this Herod the Great mentioned at the time ruled Galilee as a tetrarch. And a tetrarch is simply a Roman governor of one of the four divisions. Pilate was the boss in charge and, uh, and Caesar, and then Pilate, and then you had the Herods. So there's the Herod, was ruled one of the four divisions. He ruled at the time, the little history, he ruled at the time from 37 BC to 4 BC. And this was around the time of Jesus' birth. We don't know, um, four, between the span of four years. Uh, when B.C. to A.D. actually changed. But he was an Edomian. We'll come back to that. Um, he was an Edomian. That's extremely important of his lineage. But what an Edomian is, is simply a descendant of Esau, which means he was an Edomite. Herod, the great was a power-hungry king. He was someone that was ready to conquer and rule. He just loved to be in charge. Whatever it takes for him to be in charge, he will go ahead and do so. Whoever he has to sacrifice, whoever he has to kill. This Herod was very, he, he wanted power so much. He went as far as sacrificing his wife and his children. He had his wife and his children killed so that he could be friends with somebody. He could be friends with um, another king in, a, in another kingdom so that uh, eventually he will go ahead and take over. This is how power hungry he was. Different from Alexander the Great we talked about last time um, that actually just went to conquer and did it in a quick time, but power hungry Herod was the way he spoke using words in order to draw people to his side. So him being this kind of person goes ahead to hear that there are wise men coming from the east to visit a king in his own region where he's living. Now for any king that hears this kind of news gets troubled but then, knowing the kind of person Herod is, this troubles him even more. Is somebody going to take over me and my position? That's the mindset he has. And two reasons, two major reasons here that we know that we'll see it's an issue for him. One is that he believes his throne is threatened. He sees that uh, so if this person actually becomes a king, I will no longer be in power. I will no longer have authority. My, whatever I say will not be as strong as anymore because this king that's coming to Galilee will actually now be the one controlling, not me. 
So this is how he saw his identity. I have to be empowered to be somebody. I have to be in charge in order for my voice to be heard. Now, the second reason we know, as we mentioned, the Herod was an Edomian. So being a descendant of Esau, an Edomite, is a very big problem. Because we go back looking at the Old Testament, we know that there's always been a fight between Esau and Jacob. Hence, there's been a fight between the descendants of Esau and the descendants of Jacob. And that creates a lot of wrath. Because Esau did, he took wives that his parents did not approve of. And the parents were against this. And he went ahead and said, no, I have to. I'm marrying these people. So he, he goes away from his parents. There's a fight in the family. And well, we know that earlier, Jacob took his birthright. So if Esau did have the birthright, knowing that Christ would have come down from the descendants of Esau, if Esau still had the birthright, this hurts every descendant when they go ahead and say, when the parents tell the children that we could have had this privilege, we could have had these blessings. But because the Israelites took the birthright away from our lineage, we now have to fight. But God is on their side and we have to work extra hard. So this mindset is built in every descendant going downwards. And there is this hate that is going on continuously. So let's look at Amos 1, 11. This hate still goes on at the time of the prophets. Because we see, thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Edom, and for four, I will not turn away its punishment, because he pursued his brother with a sword and cast off all pity, his anger there, Anger tore perpetually, and he kept his wrath forever. The Edomite's wrath kept on going continually. It kept on going. It wasn't just continuously, but continually. There was no hold back of, uh, I will forgive for a time. But everyone that came from Edom had a wrath, a strong hatred towards the Israelites. So now... Herod, being a descendant, still having this wrath against the Israelites, hears that the king that is coming is not just someone that will take over me, but is coming from the people that I have a wrath against. This is a big reason that Herod will find it very difficult to accept that person taking over his region. knowing that he will be a king of the Jews. He's finally felt, I'm taking over, the, I'm now the one leading the Jews as an Edomite, but now someone is coming to dethrone me. Herod's, one of his strong points, as we said earlier, was flattery. He knew how to flatter to win anyone over. So he goes ahead to try and use this for the wise men. In Matthew 2, verse 8, we see here, he sent them to Bethlehem and said to the wise men, Go and search carefully for the young child. And when you have found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. This, was, this were his words, trying to flatter, you know, go ahead and do this. I'm going to deceive you. We know... Um, there was a, a lot of deceit going on in the Old Testament, but now Herod the Great is saying, I'm going to use that as well. I have this gift. It's always worked for him. That's how he warned his way up to become Herod the Great, someone that has conquered a lot. And he thinks, this has always worked for me, hence I'm going to go ahead and use it again. Go and let me know when you find a young child that I would worship him. 
We don't know how many wise men there were, but we do know um, that they, um, they brought Jesus gifts. And you see here, when there is an important individual that would change the world, anyone, and this is just not as a king, but if it is that you are an important person, like in the time it says Jeremiah, before I formed you, I knew you and ordained you to be a prophet. When anyone that's important that will change the world is born, whether we are born physically or we are born again, so we are born spiritually. And that is through repentance. The devil always tries to make sure that that, import, that that individual does not fulfill their purpose. And that is why the closer you get to what it is God has called you to do, the, the more resistance you will get. Resistance is a sign of advancement. When you, things automatically start getting difficult, when you feel you're growing and things automatically start getting difficult, that is, and I, I see that as, a, as good news, and that shows that I am pushing forward. The enemy is terrified that I'm getting somewhere, and I will bring him down by, with, at the rates that I'm moving. So, Jesus now is born, and that is the biggest resistance for the devil at this time. Be, that someone is coming to bring him down, that he will have, no longer have as much power as he thought he did. So I want you to know that no matter, and for those of you that want to take this in and say amen, no matter who inquires to ruin your life, God will protect you because you are his child. We see that in Matthew 2, 12. God will protect you because you are his child and there was a protection for Jesus here it says then being divinely warned in a dream Herod went ahead to throw his uh, um, throw his flattery in there will still be the attacks going ahead but the protection says being divinely warned in a dream made it very clear that they should not return to Herod they departed for their own country and went and not another way whether it would have been a longer way but there was safety safety for God's child and safety for Jesus and so it is that you might have a longer route to reach your destination but there will be safety for you so as now the king is born go to my three points there were three gifts that were given i said this is why people usually think that there are three wise men but we know that we could carry multiple gifts ourselves when we're going somewhere we, we're visiting someone we don't have to it doesn't have to be one person per gift so there were three gifts and the first and point number one is gold the first gift is gold. We'll be looking at Isaiah 9, 6. What says, for unto us a child is born, unto us a child, a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Count, um, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Why would they bring gold when a king is born? The significance is this is how we actually respect and show that there is a king on earth. We bring the best. And we know that gold is the, the most expensive, the strongest of, um, well, not just the strongest, but the mo uh, best out there. So gold is showing that Jesus is king. This is the clothes that they had for a gift for even though his king, his kingdom is not of this world. But Jesus clearly stated that in John 18, 36. It says, Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. My, if my kingdom were of this world, my servants will fight 
so that they should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. It's at the time they wanted to kill him. Um, and Judas has brought for them to take, uh, and Paul goes ahead, Peter, sorry, Peter goes ahead to cut the ear of Malchus. But Jesus is saying, my kingdom is not of this world. So they brought the gold saying, yes, we're going to respect him that a king is born. So there is now prophesied here in Jeremiah 39. The Old Testament prophecies about his birth. And Jeremiah 39 prophesies him being king. says, but they shall serve the Lord their God and David their king, whom I will raise up for them. And David, their king, we know that Jesus comes down from the lineage of David. But Jeremiah is prophesying this after the time of David. So when it says, they shall serve the Lord their God, and, and so the same person, David, their king, is talking about the lineage comes down from the highest king Israel had ever had of, at the time up unto Jesus. So the gold signifies that he is king. And he is seated at the right hand of the father right now. So you see that in Ephesians 1, 20 to 21. That Jesus, it says, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power, and might, and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And so we sang today, O be lifted, and Hosea, Hosanna in the highest. Say for that, the choir was with me on, on the message. But his kingship is not on this world, but he says he is seated above. with all principality and power, all might and dominion. And his name is above every name. So the kingdom that he has is the most powerful kingdom, is the strongest, the one that has all might and all dominion. Jesus has all authority beyond and all human ability. Say that again. Jesus has all authority beyond all human ability. He has that power. And that's why we can say, oh, our, your disciples have tried and tried. And he comes and says, where is your faith? And does an immediate healing. And that's why they can go ahead and say this person is dead. And he will say, wake up. That is why in your life something could be going on and immediately there is a change, a move in the positive direction. So there is gold. They brought the gold to signify his kingship, to signify authority. Now the second gift that they did bring, the point number two, is frankincense. This means whiteness or it's pure incense. The word frankincense means it's purity. There is purity in that individual. He's not just any king, but he is one that is pure, without blemish. Sitting in John 1, 1. Signifying Jesus' deity. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This shows that he is a king that is without blemish, so he is deity. He, he was the Word, and the word, he's, he is the Word, and he was with God, and he is God. Okay, so this is another verse that will prove that there is a trinity that no, Jesus is God, the Father is God, and going to the Holy Spirit is God. See, let's go to John 8, 28, that he has 
been God from the beginning of time. It says, then Jesus said to them, when you lift up the son of man, then you will know that I am he and that I do nothing of myself. But as the father has taught me, I speak these things. So it says, I am he. Then you will know that I am he. So as dating, we, we see, we know for John that there are seven I ams. I am the bread of life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. And there are seven I ams that Jesus says with confidence, I am he. So whoever we need him to be, he is I am. We've seen in Exodus, he actually told, Mo, the father told Moses, I am that I am. So whatever we need Jesus to be for us, he is. I am healer, Jehovah Rapha. When it is that we are lacking something, I am your provider, Jehovah Jireh. So he has... One thing we see here in Jeremiah 33, verses 15 and 16, as he having the, being the deity, it says, In those days and at that time, this was the prophecy, I will cause to grow up to David a branch of righteousness. He shall execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. In those days, Judah will be saved. So, and Jerusalem will dwell safely. So it's at the time of Jesus being on earth, and this is the name by which Jesus will be called, the Lord, our righteousness. The Lord, our righteousness. So we see Jehovah Shitkenu is the term here. It says, I am Jehovah Shitkenu. And this is someone to be in right standing with God. So he is capable of being all pure. As well, the frankincense, they brought frankincense because he is capable of putting us in right standing with God. And that is why he came down on earth to die for our sins, to put us with a right standing with God. So that is what Jeremiah prophesied, his birth and death. I says, I am Jehovah Shitkenu. I am the Lord, your righteousness. So we've seen that he is the king from the gold and from the frankincense. He is the deity with all purity. And the third gift they brought to him was mire. What is mire signifying? It means it's an embalming oil. And when, we, when they put oil and to embalm someone, it was after they have died. And back in the time, this is how they preserved the body until the funeral and all that. So there were, a, embalming oil was brought in Songs of Solomon 4.6. We'll look at Songs of Solomon 4.6. It says, until the day breaks and the shadows flee away, I will go my way to the mountain of mire and to the hill of frankincense. To the mountain of Mire, the Golgotha, the place where there is the death, and to the heel of frankincense, dies with all purity. So he's dying with all purity so that we, our sins, can be forgiven. Dying without sin. So we see in Matthew 26, verses 61 to 64, this proves his, his mortality where he was a man. He said, I could die. It says, and he said, this fellow, now this is at the time of Jesus' death, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. And the high priest arose and said to him, do you answer nothing? What is it that this man testify against you? But Jesus kept silent, and the high priest, Caiaphas, answered and said to him, I put you under an oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. So 
He is saying, tell us if you are the son of God. People are saying, they're testifying to, and Cypher is saying, they're testifying that you are the son of God. But you're keeping quiet when they're saying, mocking you and saying all these things against you. And one of the things that Jesus will answer, yes, I am the son of God. But in verse 64, he actually um, says, Jesus said to him, it is as you said, nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter you will see the son of man. You will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of the, of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Tell us if you are the son of God, but I'm answering I'm the son of man. I am answering that there is no mortality in me right now. I am capable of dying as the son of man for your sakes. I am capable of going ahead to do all this that with the resurrection so that your sins will be forgiven. And it says, I will be sitting at the right hand of power. I will be sitting at the right hand of power, not just anyone, but someone that has all power. The Father says, although, one thing we see with the mire is that although he was going to die, he will rise with power. He will rise with all powers. We read earlier that the name above every name. At that name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. So these are the significances of why there were three gifts brought. Seeing then gold and says a king that is pure and can't, that is pure and is still deity, but can still die and resurrect for our sakes. So now we know that a king is born, and the king that was born was one in which his kingdom is in heaven. It's fully man and fully God. No king on earth, no matter how much power he has, can stop him. Herod the Great couldn't do anything. All he could do was try and flatter to try and get Jesus killed. So I want you to know today that there is a king in you. There is someone with all power in you. So when you go out with that knowledge from now on, go out with that understanding that the one that is in me is greater than he that is in the world. Stop living your life with depression or confusion, but live your life as someone that knows, has the knowledge of who you have. And I pray that your eyes will be open like how it, it in the time of Gehazi, when Gehazi was blind and Elisha said, pray for Lord, open the eyes of this people. Open, the, open his eyes to see of how much it is that he is protected. We, stop, we should stop looking in the physical because something is going on and there is a hold back in our lives. But understand that there is a king in you. So go out and live your life without fear now that you have that knowledge. Let's pray. Let's pray that whatever it is that you know it is that you're struggling with, whether it's anxiety, whether it's a fear, that the Lord will bring to your remembrance and knowledge of the King that is in you.
let's thank God for coming on earth to be born as man, to die for our sins, live for 33 and a half years, rose with all power, that we will go ahead and walk out with that understanding of the gold and the frankincense. The person that is in us is a deity and a king and a mire. In Jesus' name we pray. And Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the king that is born. We thank you for it, that no one can stop us as we are your children. We are your children, hence you protect us with all love. We thank you, O oh Lord, for the gifts and how important they are for our relationship with you and Lord as we go into this Christmas season we pray that we would never forget that you are the main reason for the season open the hearts of the people to go out and show that you having you is the most important in our in your lives take control father we thank you lord for in jesus name we pray amen